Humble people are happy to contribute to the kingdom work any way they can, just so they can contribute. They're not hung up on privileges. They're not hung up on prestige or on position. They don't seek the limelight. And in this regard, we're going to talk a little bit about the Apostle Paul. Now, Brother Lippold mentioned in his talk that Paul was not a man to boast, and that's quite true. Actually, Paul was a very humble man. Now, think about this. At the time Paul was converted, about 34 CE, Jesus told Ananias that Paul was going to have a wonderful privilege. Let's read about it. Acts chapter 9, Acts 9 and 15. And this is Jesus to Ananias. But the Lord said to him, Go, because this man is a chosen vessel to me to bear my name to the nations as well as to kings and to the sons of Israel. A chosen vessel. How about that? How did Paul react? Did he let that go to his head? Did he immediately go up to Jerusalem and volunteer to be on the governing body, saying, well, now that I'm anointed, I can be on the governing body? No, he stayed where he was in Damascus, and he kept preaching the good news. Now, in 36 CE, he did go up to world headquarters in Jerusalem. And uh, how did he react? Did he say, here I am, the chosen vessel. I'm here to help you run the place. He stayed with the Apostle Peter for a couple of weeks. Apparently, Peter had moved to Jerusalem, but he kept preaching. He just put his head to the ground and he kept preaching the good news until one day Jesus appeared to him when Paul was in the temple. And he told Paul that he had to leave Jerusalem immediately because the Jews were out to kill him. As we've discussed, Governing Body Member David Splain is here addressing Gilead graduates, and it seems that the main thrust of his talk is to impress upon them the need for humility. And in making this appeal, he's dipping into the New Testament, particularly stories from the book of Acts, to talk about the attitude of the Apostle Paul, who, again, was not one of the Twelve, and yet arguably had far more influence on what we now perceive as Christianity than any individual who was on the Twelve. I mean, just think about it. Think of all the letters, the epistles that are in the New Testament. Think of the wall of text that this individual supposedly contributed to the Bible compared to the individuals or even the Twelve collectively. The writings of Paul far outweigh what the Apostles, what the Twelve actually contributed and here in David Splain's summary of Paul, he's describing Paul or alluding to the fact that Paul was considered a chosen vessel. So Paul had a special position that had nothing to do with the apostles, nothing to do with the older men. He got to do his own thing. And indeed, when you read the book of Acts, it's obvious that Paul isn't receiving any directions. He's not receiving directions from, as David Splain puts it, a world headquarters in Jerusalem. Now, in 36 CE, he did go up to world headquarters in Jerusalem. What world headquarters in Jerusalem? World headquarters. <laughs> We're talking about the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean is not the world. He's just so desperate to make the Bible describe his authority or the authority of the governing body. To shoehorn his narrative or the narrative of a centralized leadership into what's described in the scriptures. But the scriptures describe no such thing. You have in the scriptures 
a man, Paul, doing his own thing, not beholden to the apostles in Jerusalem, but rather cooperating with them and deciding for himself where he gets assigned to, deciding for himself where he needs to preach and what he needs to do. So I find it fascinating that in trying to remind Gilead graduates of the need for humility, of the need to submit to the authority of the organization, again, David Splain, who clearly is lacking in his knowledge of the Bible, cannot help but give clues pointing to the fact that there was no governing body, there was no centralized leadership, and individuals like the Apostle Paul, a chosen vessel, could do more or less whatever they wanted. I was thinking of the lovely interview we just heard where the brother talked about how he eventually ended up in the circuit work, but before that time, Jehovah gave him a little training. And uh, perhaps that's what happened to the Apostle Paul. Do you know that Paul may have remained in Tarsus for eight years, preaching. And then Barnabas came along. Eleven years after Paul's conversion, Barnabas came along and invited him to Antioch. And from that time on, Paul started to have privileges. And uh, five years after that, Paul wrote his first inspired letter that we cherish to this day. Paul worked hard all his life. He did more than any of the twelve apostles, but he was never upset that he wasn't counted among them. Well, how does that square up with the governing body arrangement today? Paul, a chosen vassal, does more than any of the other apostles. He writes the majority of the New Testament, and yet he's not a governing body member. It just doesn't make any sense. If we were to see this replicated today, then Christopher Kitts <laughs> would be the star of Jehovah's Witness leadership, and he would be mentioned in the same breath as the governing body. In fact, we would be hearing more about Christopher Kitts than we hear about David Splain, Stephen Lett, Tony Morris, and so on. And I found it interesting that David Splain referred to Christopher Kitts and the claim that Christopher Kitts made earlier on in the graduation about having been trained by Jehovah. That experience was amazing because that's where Jehovah gave me my training. So this guy, Christopher Kitts, makes this claim about Jehovah being his mate and... <laughs> providing him personal training. And David Splain just takes his word for it. Oh, well, Christopher said that he was trained by Jehovah. That must have happened. <laughs> Why would Christopher Kitts brag about something like that? Why would he just make that up? You know, he'd have to be deluded or something. And clearly he's a sane, rational, humble individual. <laughs> So David Splain just accepts that Christopher Kitts was personally trained by God and says, well, that's what it must have been like for the Apostle Paul. Well, again, David Splain, if you're drawing this comparison, if you're saying that the way things were in first century Christianity is the way things are now, then why aren't we seeing Christopher Kitts hosting JW Broadcasting, why aren't we seeing him writing books and providing spiritual food all by himself, which is what he would need to do if the model that's described in Acts and in the New Testament were to be applied to the modern day? 